Hello, everyone. I'm David, part of the Australian Student Christian Movement. Uh, we have a special guest with us today. Can you tell us who you are? Hi, uh, David and listeners. I'm Jason Steinberg. I'm the chairman of the Queensland Holocaust Museum and Education Centre, and also, for the interest of your viewers, the president of the Queensland Jewish Board of Deputies. Excellent. Now, we're here to discuss um, the opening of the Holocaust Museum in Brisbane. Before we do that, I just want to acknowledge the traditional lands on which we meet and acknowledge our uh, elders past, present and emerging. Why does Brisbane need a Holocaust Museum? So we, we were the only uh, city, mainland city in Australia without uh, one or a commitment to establish one. And what I saw um, is the rise in anti-Semitism across Queensland, but also Australia and the world. And, and having a Holocaust museum and remembering what happened during those times is, is absolutely an antidote to countering anti-Semitism. So it was really important for, for us as a Jewish community to advocate for the establishment of this museum and more importantly, to educate the future. So that, that's why it's really important that we now have one. And when you talk to people, especially young people, uh, about the Holocaust, are you surprised about how much they know or how little they know or, or, or the parts they know? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. So um, in the education system in Queensland, it's not mandatory for, for students to study the Holocaust. Um, if teachers feel comfortable, they can teach it in years nine and 10 history and English, because there's a World War II topic. And we did some research with teachers that um, they really didn't feel comfortable teaching, teaching the Holocaust because of the subject matter. So when, when we're talking to, uh, to children, mostly at around that age, that um, you know, 13, 14, 15 and above, um, their knowledge of the Holocaust is, is limited. Um, so we're really intent, and that's why we're the Holocaust Museum and Education Centre, because we really want to provide the, the background for teachers to be able to teach it. So we've got syllabus ready to go that's um, uh, harmonised with Victorian syllabus, uh, and, and we want to change that. So when you speak to me, David, in a year or so's time, I want to be able to tell you that awareness of the Holocaust in that age group has, has gone um, through the roof. And how do you find with young adults? Is it the yeah. same kind of thing, or they got? Yeah, a, lo a lot of people um, don't really know. They they might have heard the topic Holocaust, but they don't know the breadth and depth of what the Holocaust was. And when you explain to them that the Holocaust was the industrialized murder of six million Jews and five million other people by the Nazi regime. They, they kind of, it's hard for them to comprehend, but we, we need to let them know about how this began in 1933. And you, you touched on it then, what, what it is. When someone says to you, what is the Holocaust? How do you describe it? So yeah, the, the Holocaust was a, a period from 1933 to 1945, where the Nazi party essentially uh, took to eradicate uh, the, the Europe of Jews. So there were about um, 9 million Jews living in Europe during that period of time. And, and it was the Nazi government, the German government's um, uh, platform to eradicate the whole of Europe of Jewish people and anyone else who was different. Um, so people who, who they felt were different were, were gay men, Jehovah's Witnesses, black people, communists, um, prisoners of war were all... Um, all meant to be eradicated. And can you tell us about the museum and education centre itself? What what is there? Yeah, so so we're in a we're in a beautiful location. Um, we're in a partnership with the Catholic Archdiocese of Brisbane, um, uh, who who are our landlord, and it's wonderful um, that we're in a very central part of Brisbane CBD, and and it's a beautiful area where you go down a tunnel. And you're you're below ground ground level in in the heart of Brisbane, and and what we what we've tried to um, show visitors, um, David, is to is to really what what is the Holocaust 101, but through the voices and the artifacts of Queensland survivors, 
I'm not, uh, uh, a fact is that when, when the war finished in 1945, there were about 27,000 Holocaust survivors that came to Australia. It was the furthest part away from Europe as they could possibly get, apart from New Zealand, but it was, it was, the, it was one of the only places that they felt like they, this could never happen to them again. So, so we were recipient of, of over 200 of those amazing survivors that came. And, and we've, we've located a lot of their um, testimonies which they've given and a lot of their artifacts that their families now own or, or some of the Holocaust survivors that are still with us have donated those artifacts. So people can hear and see the stories of what the Holocaust was. So before the war started, uh, before 1933, I should say, before uh, life before for Jews in Europe, uh, then life during the Holocaust, and then life after the Holocaust, and what the reaction of people were was, and what their lives became. And that's one of the things I want to ask you about. I, on one of the displays, it talks about when the war ended. Some people didn't want to return, or some people were still subjected to hostility or they ended up in refugee camps. Can you give a bit of an idea of what it was like immediately after the war ended? Mm. So, so I think, you know, all of those scenarios happened. So when, when the concentration camps, which were designed by the Nazis to exterminate Jews and other people, when they were liberated by, by the Allied forces, the Soviets, the Americans and the English, um, where were the, where were the Jews to go? They, they, tried to go some tried to go home but found other people living in their houses who were who were told by the government that they could take possession of whatever they wanted because the Jews were gone um and when that happened people went okay there's no life for me here I'm going to find a new life um others were put in dispersed placement camps as you said that were established by the United Nations and and they found refugee status across the globe and some, of course, in Australia. They also went to Palestine um, as, as the home of the Jewish people. Uh, they, went, they went to um, Palestine. Um, some stayed for, for have, have remained there through generations and some came, came to Australia and the United States as well. Um, but but what, what's really interesting is that many, many Jews and the United Nations found this when they um, went into displaced persons camps, there was no intention from any of the Jewish population to get revenge. They wanted to start a new life and to put it all behind them. And you touched on this before about life before um, the Holocaust. Can you give us an idea of, of what life was like for Jewish people before the Holocaust, can you? Yeah, so, so in, in Germany, um, uh, a lot of a lot of Jews were very um, patriotic Germans. They they fought in World War One as as German soldiers, um, and and they were part of all all parts of society, from doctors, musicians, teachers, unemployed people, bakers, um, coffee shop owners, uh, tailors. They they were through and much like uh, Jews are in Queensland, where we. Where we we do lots of things, we're integrated into society and 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 help the help the community. Um, and and so life for Jews across Europe was was um, was good. Um, there was an all, always a, an air of anti-Semitism, which um, you know comes and goes depending on on society's um, uh, views at the time. But Jewish life was was good. Re religions are obviously very important. Um, foundation of of uh, of, of Judaism, uh, both um, traditionally and and culturally um, and and religiously. So there was an there was the full extent of of Judaism from the Orthodox through to the liberal or conservative movements were all there uh, in in pre nineteen thirty three Germany and Europe. And can you give us an idea about Judaism? What is sure. it? Judaism, one of one of the oldest religions, one of the three monotheistic religions with with Christianity and Islam, and and in the Jewish religion um, we have uh, the Torah, which is the Old Testament or five five books of Moses, um, and and that's what we we follow, and it and it follows a a lunar calendar, so um, uh, celebrations like Passover, which your your audience would be very aware of. 
is is similar to Easter in terms of timing. Um, we we have major major high holy days, so Passover is one. Uh, Yom Kippur, which is our Day of Atonement, where we fast from sunset to to sunset for for uh, that period of time. Uh, we have Rosh Hashanah, which is our New Year, um, and and a lot of a lot of our religious activity is centered around those those festivals um, and also food. Um, food, uh, both um, religiously and culturally, is really important to to the Jewish faith. Um, so, yes, it, it's a it's a very uh, and and for those of your listeners who've been to to Israel and and uh, and visited Israel, you, you're really walking through the Old Testament wherever you go. There's there's names of places and and history is is living and breathing in 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 Israel. And what does a service look like if you go to say an Orthodox synagogue? What would it look like? Yeah, so so an, an Orthodox synagogue, um, we have um, two main um, prayer times, I suppose. One is a Friday night, which is the start of our Sabbath. Um, so Friday night, the first star brings in the the Sabbath, and uh, that is that ends on um, Saturday evening. And during that period of time, um, there are services on in in our in our synagogues on a Friday night and a Saturday morning. Um, and and the Shabbat or Sabbath is 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 the holiest time of of the the week for for Jewish people. It's the day of rest, um, uh, obviously to acknowledge that God created created the world on on that day. Um, and and so religious Jewish people won't won't work on on those days. They'll spend it with their families. Um, they'll spend it in prayer. They'll spend it um, by not um, turning on lights or doing anything like that. Those are all on timers in in religious Jewish homes. Um, and then and then for uh, other other parts of Jewish faith, the the, the more liberal or conservative um, Jews, they still still celebrate um, Shabbat and the festivals in exactly the same way. Um, but there are some some uh, Jewish laws which which um, are different. Um, for Orthodox and uh, and non-Orthodox, but but one of the one of the amazing things about the Jewish religion, David, is no matter no matter where you are in the world, um, you can find uh, a synagogue and 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 a Jewish community somewhere, and you you've got people who um, over a similar culture and background. One of the displays uh, talked about the German people or some German people protesting the euthanasia program that. Uh, that um, people with disabilities, you know, they were being killed, murdered by the Nazis, and the Nazis officially said, "Oh, we'll disband it," but they kept it going. My my question is, do we know much about other things the German people protest, or was that like the kind of the main thing that they protest, and everything else they just we're fine with everything else you're doing, but that you've gone too far. Yeah, it, it's a really interesting um, pick up and connection that you make there. I think what 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 happened um, with the rise of the Nazi Party? Nazi Party was established in 1920. Came into power with Hitler's um, uh, elevation to the Chancellor of Germany in 1933. The and and if you think about period of time, 1933 to the outbreak of 19 uh, of, of really Kristallnacht, which was 1939, was a a complete. Um, uh, brainwashing of the German people using propaganda to convince them that Jews needed to be exterminated, and it took that long for for Hitler and 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 his cohort to actually put that in place by using lots of lots of tools to to turn what was a what was a uh, a, a, a civilized wonderful uh, functioning society. Where where Jews and non-Jews were were friends and colleagues and and mixed together were neighbours. Um, so the the other race laws and the the as you say the the euthanasia program, I think probably and and there's probably a lot of research on this and I'm not a, not a researcher by any any stretch of the imagination, but but because under Nazi doctrine and ideology, that anyone who was impure wasn't Aryan. Um, so therefore, if you were disabled or infirmed or ill, 
then you were you essentially ticked a box that allowed the state, um, uh, the German state, um, to eradicate. But you you were eradicated. So I can imagine that that may have um, crossed a line for some German people. But let let's uh, let's see. There may be some of your listeners who are well versed in this. Uh, topic and researched on it and uh, and they could potentially share that. One of the other displays talked about how to avoid uh, Allied bombings, they were forced to work underground. Can you give us a, an idea of that? Because I think sometimes when we think of camps, we think, oh yeah, barbed wire, you're up above ground, but there were other um, versions as well. Yeah, that, that's right. So, so during World War II, um, obviously, the the Nazis were were at war, um, and and it's said by um, historians they they were waging two wars. One was against the the Allies, and the other was against the Jews and the extermination of Jews. So so the war effort that was required by Germany needed a lot of forced labour, and that was um, that was run by the Germans um, to um, but, and and the forced labour was Jewish. Jewish people, prisoners of war, and anyone who was interned in in camps. And if you think about um, a country at war, they need obviously supply of a whole range of things from clothing, military, um, through through to large machinery. And the production of that needed to be secure. So um, there was um, extensive tunnels and, and, and those kinds of programs to be making bombs 24 seven um, using forced labor. Um, I, I mean, imagine you've, you've got a workforce of up to 9 million people that you can deploy, work through the night. If they died, the Germans didn't care. And, and that's, what, that's what happened. So um, there's a, a wonderful um, Queensland survivor, um, a guy called George Stein, who, who was actually in one of those underground um, labor camps in um, Dora, it, it's called DORA, and and he he was making um, v v one and v two rockets um, uh, for the for the Germans under forced labour, and he talks about this in his testimony in the in the museum. It, it was horrific conditions, as you can imagine. But he was so clever; he actually made a little tweak to every bomb that he made, and and that tweak meant the bombs would never go off and be detonated when they hit the ground. They just they just hit the ground didn't explode. So um, yeah, amazing courage. Now, a lot of people know about the Warsaw Ghetto, but there were many more. Can you kind of talk about some of the other ones or just how mm. many there were? Yeah, so there, there was a, 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 a very um, extensive um, ghetto, uh, ghettoization of Jewish people. Um, uh, the, the first Jewish ghetto was was actually in Italy, um, or called it called a ghetto, and it was really where where um, the Germans um, corralled the and corralled is probably a, a a reasonable term. It may sound crass, but it was like cattle being corralled into into one place. So um, there there were ghettos across Europe, in Poland, in Hungary. In Latvia, in Lithuania, wherever wherever Jews lived, the Nazis and their collaborators designated places in the city in 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 a small radius, and put all the Jews into that. Lots of these these European cities had Jewish quarters or Jewish little Jewish suburbs where where Jews lived. Those often became the foundation of those ghettos, and they brought every Jew in, a Jewish person in, and and walled up that ghetto as a way of holding them before they were put on transportation to extermination camps. So um, you mentioned Warsaw, very famous. Uh, Lodz, Lodz ghetto in, in Poland is also a very, very famous one. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it, there were there was a network across Europe. And Jewish people did fight back. Can you talk a little bit about the Warsaw Uprising? Yeah, so the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising is one of one of the um, really uh, the first and most famous uprisings that the Jewish people um, there saw um, and and realised where these trains that were leaving the ghetto 
were going to, and that was to um, Auschwitz-Birkenau, which was one of six extermination camps established by the Nazis. And so you can imagine in these ghettos, there was there was very little food, very little sanitation, dehumanisation of the Jewish people. But there were a number of number of young Jewish people who decided to stand up against the Nazis and and to fight back before they were to be transported. Um, so they um, essentially had a few weapons that they were able to find, guns and and other things. Um, but they 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 repressed the the Nazis for a period of time um, and then hid in hid in alleyways and under underground locations in the within the Warsaw ghetto uh, until and and they nearly lasted a month um in 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 a siege in an uprising basically to uh, repel the German forces uh, until Germany said okay we've had enough of this and we'll just send in the tra- tanks and troops and everyone was everyone was um basically got um, round up in Warsaw ghetto and removed to Auschwitz now you have a display that talks about the genocides that have happened since the Holocaust in Cambodia and Myanmar. Now this is a tough question. Why do we keep allowing genocides to happen? It's a it's a it's a it's a very good question and one that um, I think society needs to really take a take a look at. If you if you think about um, Genocide. The word genocide was actually only established to describe what happened to the Jews uh, in the in the Holocaust. Um, and so, to see it and to know that it's happened since um, it is really something for us all to consider. No matter what faith you are, no matter where you live in the world, um, how do we ensure that our elected leaders and some some genocide since have not been perpetrated by elected officials but but in in democratic countries how do we ensure that um there can never be policies that target um race um and and i i i feel that the, the every generation david we need to educate more and more so they understand what the worst form of racial bigotry and hatred looks like, which is the Holocaust. It's the, it stands alone as the most documented um, part of history, modern history. There's, there's, there's one thing about the the Germans and Nazis; they were meticulous in their record keeping, meticulous in in the in those that they killed and keeping records of the numbers of people that they killed and records of everything that they perpetrated and 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 consumed um we as a society and the next generation need to know and watch out for these signs and can you tell us a little bit about the righteous among the nation righteous mm. among the nation yes so the you can imagine you know there were we we talked a bit about the german people standing up against against the regime around euthanasia but there were there were lots of good people, um, you know, a lot of good Christian people who who helped Jews survive during during the war. Someone like Oscar Schindler, for example, is is probably well known because of Thomas Keneally's book and then Steven Spielberg's movie. But people like Oscar Oscar Schindler and many others um, were saved Jews. They put their own lives and their families' lives at risk. To save Jews, and they they um, are known as the righteous among the nations, which is an award given by the Israeli government uh, through Yad Vashem, which is the World Holocaust um, um, Memorial in Israel, and and they're um, they're honoured because of what they did and saved Jewish lives. And I saw one of the displays you have is it's a it was a charity event at City Hall to help. Um, Jewish people. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, so this this was before the outbreak of World War II. So in the late 1930s, um, the the Jewish community um, were seeing the plight of of Jews in in Germany and Europe, 
and so they um, they ran a a concert um, with um, a whole range of performers, classical performers, um, to to raise funds to send back to help um, German German Jews during that time. And yes, in Brisbane, we we um, they organised that event. You talk a lot about education, and we have to educate people. If people want to learn about the Holocaust, where do they start? Where where do you direct them? Yeah. So um, there's some um, wonderful um, organisations which um, have have fantastic resources. So um, at the at the moment, we're about to press press go live. It'll be later in later in August, but. Um, we've created in Queensland um, a, a virtual Holocaust education experience, which takes the, the viewer, um, you can view it from your desktop, um, takes, your viewer, takes the viewer into pre-war Europe and, and talks about what happened there and, you, and shows videos from um, Queensland survivors and it takes you on that journey of pre-war, war, post-war war, uh, the Holocaust. So so that will be available as a fantastic resource. Um, so that will be accessible off our website um, in uh, in late August. Um, but in the interim, um, there's uh, there's there's two um, wonderful um, global resources. One is Yad Vashem, as I as I mentioned. The other is the uh, United States Holocaust Memorial uh, Museum, um, which which has um, wonderful resources for for people to uh, to access, um, and, and that's a good starting point. Thank you so much for joining us, Jason. Thanks for having me, David.